have a drink. This is the man room. Welcome into the man room. Thanks for joining me. I'm your host, Marcus Bridges. And uh, this podcast I'm super excited about. We'll get to our guests in, a man, in the man room in just a second. Uh, first, I just want to say, make sure to jump by the website, www.themanroompodcast.com. You can check us out by searching the man room podcast on literally any platform that you're on. And uh, we even got a Patreon page that has some free stuff up on there right now. You can check out that will not be free in the coming weeks. So uh, that's all of the paperwork and business uh, because I'm trying to make that as short as possible because I get sick of hearing it at the beginning of every podcast. Uh, my guest today in the man room is uh, somebody that I've worked with going back a lot of years. And uh, we've actually worked across multiple industries together. Um, comedian, uh I will say flower cultivator and breeder and uh, all around great dude, Mike McGowan. Welcome to the man room. Thanks so much for joining me, man. Oh man. That's way too much early on. That's, <laughs> that's way too much. Jack of all trades. You forgot glory hole enthusiast. Oh, There's right, also that too. How could so I forget that one? <laughs> we, we weren't cross uh, industry in that either. So, I mean, that's also a thing, but <laughs> Well, I really appreciate you, man. You're only the third person that's been in here live and in person at this point. So I can see why, too. You try and keep it low key. You don't want people coming over here and seeing how cool it is. <laughs> All of us ex comics who have podcasts now as the thing to do, and you have like an actual studio. And I'm like, shit, I thought I had my stuff dialed in. <laughs> Well, here's the key, Mike, is you, you don't have a job anymore and you turn this into ha like you try to pretend like it's a job, even though nobody's paying you. All right. All right. Um, I'm taking notes. I know what I got to do now. <laughs> all right. I'm going I'm writing in uh, that I'm going to quit tomorrow. <laughs> I guess that's what's going to happen. So, <laughs> Oh, man. So uh, we'll get to actually what you do here uh, in just a moment, because obviously uh, it's very interesting. I'm very interested in it. I was in the industry for a while and I can't wait to talk about that because you're the first like super experienced cannabis industry guy I've had in here and I've been waiting for it because I know there's a ton of people that want to hear about it and I know that it's a super interesting topic and it's kind of unique to our state so yeah. um, I'm stoked about that but uh, you told me a little story in our Facebook message uh, that you were going to stop by a bar and get yourself uh, a drink today because you don't drink alcohol which uh, is totally cool in the man room. We're, you know, we're friendly to everybody and anybody up here. But what did you bring in to drink today? Uh, because you told me and I, I snorted milk out my nose. I was eating cereal. So, <laughs> Well, so uh, for me, I don't drink. I haven't drank in uh, shit close to fuck, over a decade now. Wow. So um, as an open micer, you're in bars completely all the time. So uh, whenever I would be at open mics, just nervously, I would be chugging several Shirley Temple's a night. Um, <laughs> so I became the Shirley Temple guy, you know. I also would use it to impress, the, you know, the people, you know, anybody I was trying to maybe hook up with. I get extra cherries and I can tie the cherry stem with my tongue. Really? So um, because it's a podcast, I won't do it for the podcast <laughs> listening audience. The theater of the mind that comes with radio. But yes. Yeah. Shirley Temple life, of course. So. Sure. Well, hopefully there'll be a video aspect to this podcast at some point in time. And the next time you come in with the Shirley Temple, we're going to we're going <laughs> to demand that you do it on camera. So I'll do I'll do the cherry <laughs> tie for the fans. And uh, by then, there'll be an underground swell being like, oh, my God, he can do that. Hey. <laughs> and just in the nick of time, too, because the bars are going to start to open back up. And it's better if you go out there with a known talent than have to prove yourself. <laughs> exactly. Again, right? I'm not starting from scratch at all. <laughs> Well, I'm doing a first time thing on this podcast uh, for me. It's been talked about a little bit in the earlier episodes about how uh, some of the, the people that listen and also the people that have been on are getting into this new hard seltzer thing. You know, it's as we age, uh, calories start to get scrutinized and counted and your doctor starts to bitch about all sorts of things. <laughs> uh, so I am trying a hard seltzer. It's only 5% alcohol. It's a it's a truly wild berry. I never thought I would say those words, but uh, here I am drinking. They're not bad. I mean, it kind of tastes like hairspray, but it's not bad, you know. Uh, yeah, it's funny because my girlfriend, uh, 
we, you know, we're broken up now, but she got hardcore into the hard seltzer for a while. Uh-huh. And I took a sip of one and I was like, oh, I don't know about this. This is <laughs> garbage. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it was a little bit like Coors Light when I was a teenager. It took a few <laughs> nights of getting used to it before I actually was like, okay, I mildly enjoy this. This, it's, this is all right. Yeah. This is all right. But they are delicious. It is funny. I just feel like it's our generation's version of the Mike's Hard Lemonade. Yep. Where we're like, all right, maybe let's back off with stuff a little bit (laughs) yeah and maybe you know something that's interesting that'll kind of bridge the gap here into our talking about cannabis maybe we make something that doesn't quite so appeal to the young young generation like everybody can admit in our generation that mike's hard lemonade tasted like lemonade and that's why everybody liked it it tasted like carbonated lemonade and as a kid that didn't like beer you could drink that stuff and you could find it i mean it's not hard and uh you know it's always been I think a little bit of a, a little bit of like a, something that's flown under the radar, how alcohol kind of is like ghost marketed towards a younger crowd than it's actually made for, you know? Only for the pussies. I mean, I was in seventh grade. <laughs> in seventh grade, New Year's Eve, I got drunk on Everclear. Oh, God. So I was already hardcore <laughs> at a young age. I wasn't doing the Mike's Hard Lemonade. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, good for you, man. It's, it's more manly, more, more of a drinker, more of an adult than I ever was, man. I was drinking Bush Lights and trying to feel cool, but, you know, I actually had a buddy in college uh, – and I don't know if this ever happened to you, if you were an Everclear drinker, my buddy in, in the dorms in college started drinking just shots of Everclear and Gatorade one night, and he lost his vision for the night. Like, we Whoa. had to walk him and put him to bed, and he'll, st- I mean, he's going to come on the podcast at some point in time, but he'll tell you as a trial lawyer today that he absolutely went blind that night. He was <laughs> running into walls and everything, and did that ever happen to you? Well, so if you really want a disgusting story, it is a story I tell on stage, but in, in seventh grade at New Year's, we were doing cap shots of Everclear along with Stewart's orange cream soda. Oh. And because it was a New Year's Eve party, you know, it was all just a bunch of seventh graders up in another room drinking because we were little fucking rascals. But (laughs) one, the parents brought up uh, pigs in a blanket, you know, how you have them at parties. Oh, yeah. Um, As a seventh grader, I black out drinking Everclear. And I come to, and all the kids in the room, including some of the girls, are pointing at me going, Ew! And I look down, and on my thigh is an entire pig in the blanket with no bite marks that I had thrown up. Oh, my God. <laughs> that's a hell of a rite of passage in seventh grade, man. That's like a, that's like a story for your mid-20s, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where, where I grew up, we got into things a little bit earlier in life. I thought I was bored where I grew up. There was only 2,000 people there, but... You just, I think you probably had more access to the fun stuff than what oh, we did out more there. more access. Our, our thing in high school, I mean, we would ta- we would end up with beer out there, but we would go down to the local recycling st- center and steal a bunch of pallets and take them up on the hill and have a massive bonfire in a forest. Like, it wasn't a good <laughs> idea, you know? And, and one time we actually, we got spotted from the Forest Service lookout across the mountain valley. Really? Yeah, and they sent cops up there, but it was like four feet of snow. And, you you know, as, as the high school kids, like everybody's truck's all jacked up. Like I came from a movie about a small town. That's where I'm from. <laughs> and we were just, we drove to the top of the mountain and the cop cars couldn't get up there. And we just let the fire burn out that night because there was all the snow and we kind of felt safe about it. But yeah, I mean, just it, it was literally cases of beer in the snow standing by a fire that was way too big for that many 17-year-olds to manage, you know? <laughs> See, that sounds amazing, but also hard, because I grew up right outside of Philadelphia. So, you know, you're in a city environment, so you, there's a lot more nooks and crannies and different shit going on, so you can hide away. So we did shit that was close to that, but nothing that fire or forest service could, you know, pick out a yeah. mile or two away. I feel like those those gnarly Marks, dude, they were just. <laughs> that was just the Boy Scout kids that didn't get to. Uh, they didn't get invited to the party, and now they're sitting up in a lookout somewhere, spending their weekend. Somebody's but... having fun. I can see that over there. I'm stopping that shit. <laughs> Only you. <laughs> oh man. Well, um, dude, and and actually, that's a, a even better uh, way to bridge the gap to the next topic because 
I actually wanted to talk to you about your, you moved back to Philadelphia here a couple years ago, and then you came back to Eugene. And I know as somebody that was working in the cannabis industry alongside you at the time, different companies, but still part of the same big family. Uh, we were we were just um, sad to see you go, and also all the stand-ups that I know were super sad to see you go. Seth Milstein and I talked a little bit about it on here, about how we got one of the good ones back when you decided to come <laughs> back. Do you want to talk a little bit about, like, going back home, you know, figuring out what was right for you and then what brought you back here? Well, yeah, and um, it's funny because, you know, I, you know, I listen to Seth and Chris's episode because anytime my name's mentioned – I need to hear about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so I, I've been, I came out here to grow cannabis. So I've been, you know, growing cannabis since 2009 and, you know, went through the whole legalized process, you know, be, it was like, I'm going to join the team of, you know, not being a criminal anymore. And then I joined it. And the, when we first opened King's Cannabis, you know, there was, money backers there's financial backers and you know they're great people but it was completely different than what I was used to doing and kind of the vibe of the industry like I got into cannabis because I didn't want to work in corporations I didn't want to work in stuff like that and then when we went to legalization it started going hardcore towards very corporate very different than anything I ever really wanted to have in my life mm -hmm. And that really burned me out. I was just like, man, fuck all this. I mean, in my mind with cannabis, we set up an entire, you know, I call it the people's market. We set up the people's market that was going to be nothing like, you know, common capitalism and the way that people are doing stuff. And we we're going to do it different. A lot more profit sharing for everybody. Everybody gets rich and we have fun type of thing. Mm -hmm. So when the industry started changing, it just kind of really bummed me out. I thought we'd be able to change the world more than them change us, if that makes sense. I was like, yeah, we'll get legalized and we'll be like co-ops and we'll do stuff. And then that didn't really work out. So. The almighty dollar, man. When they say it wins every time, they really don't lie, do they? It, it's such a fucking shame. Um, and at that time, too, my mom got diagnosed with early onset Parkinson. So I was like, let me go back and spend some time with her. But I went back to Philly and I was just like, fuck, man, I'm an Oregonian now. I'm, I'm like, that's who <laughs> I am. Like, I'm, I still say water. Yeah, I still say it completely different. Some I, one time at a bar, I asked for a glass of water, and they're like, "A lager? What are you saying?" <laughs> <laughs> oh man, so that's I am, funny. I am a New Jersey guy at heart, but like I've grown up to be an Oregon person. So like just being out there, you know, everything is so much different people are more just trying to survive out here people get to enjoy the quality of life like i grow i grew up in relative poverty out there and the version of poverty out there versus the version of poverty out here completely different how so so like when i was back there i was working in a restaurant and there was a 65 year old black dude he was working for 15 bucks an hour he worked one job in the morning as a chef at a restaurant, like not the head chef, but just working in the kitchen. And then he worked at night at the restaurant that I was working at. Both jobs, 15 bucks an hour, 80, hour, 80 plus hours a week. And he was still dirt poor, barely able to survive. So like, Dude. it's fucking insane. Like I, re I remember one night I was pulling a double and he was just sitting on a five gallon bucket in the kitchen falling asleep during a slow point in the night. And I was just like, that's no way for a human being to fucking live, you know? <laughs> and like, he was a dude worked his whole entire life. And, you know, it's just like here, like I, I have tons of friends who work like 20 hours a week and have a nice, comfortable life. So it's so much different. And then the opportunities that I've been afforded in life to work in cannabis and other things like that, I live extremely comfortable. So like it was kind of like a thing of being like, oh, I kind of really turned my back on this opportunity. I didn't you know, fully get into it and appreciate it the way I should. And at the same time, my cousin, he owns Sweet Tree Farms, Vital Organics Northwest, the mm -hmm. gardening shop here in town. Uh, he bought out the investors with his friend from King's Cannabis. Um, and then he, you know, it's my cousin. 
And the people that he got to replace me, they were doing a good job. They were great growers, but they didn't have the management sense that I have. So he was like, man, I really need you back here. <laughs> <laughs> really like you to come back and get back to work, bro. <laughs> you know, I just invested all this money in this company, and uh, <laughs> I need some help with it. And, I mean, I just – I fucking love growing weed. Yeah. It's my favorite. Yeah. Like, you know, they say, uh, you know – to understand what you would do in life, just think about winning the lottery and what you'd do the next day. I would go back to growing weed the next day. Like if I won millions of dollars, a billion dollars, I would probably cut the amount of plants that I have to worry about in half. Yeah. And just grow that every day with the same people, my same friends and stuff. So it's just it's kind of like that. You know, some of the bullshit of the industry and the capitalism and all that, you can kind of – I learned that you can step up to it and kind of hold it at the door the best you can just to kind of protect the the environment that you want to do. Yeah. So, yeah. I, mean, I think it, it matters a lot to, you know, where that money comes from and to have somebody buy out, like, you know, buy it out like your cousin who was just like, I'm, I'm going to start making the decisions for this, not people that aren't in the weeds every day. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think those companies get run a lot different. And I think sometimes from a better place, um, just, you know, especially, you know, caring about humans place and everything like that. And I've known you for long enough to know that that's a really big part of your mindset is you care about people. I would say just about as much as you care about plants. It sounds like it's a one B to me and a one a, but that's okay because what you said is inspiring too. And that is that, you know, um, what, what, you, what would you do if it was the lottery and you, you want it? And, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here doing it right now and I'm kind of living that same thing. And, it's that was something that 2020 kind of taught me is like it's it's now or never you either got to go back to doing this right after everything starts or you got to figure out a way to do what you want to do and it who knows I mean I, I it's I'm really fortunate you know I've talked about it on the podcast before to have a wife that is along for the ride and she's yeah. she's you know gainfully well employed and doing great in her job so I kind of have this like this dream uh that that who knows if it's going to work out, but it's a hell of a lot of fun. And if I could get paid to do this every day, I would absolutely do this every day, you know? And, um, it's, it's inspiring to watch people like yourself, not only live that, but also make it into such a good career for yourself. Because I know how successful King's cannabis is. I spent five years in the cannabis industry, both selling it and selling, uh, extracts that were processed by it. And as a bud tender and a manager and a, uh, uh, you know, a, a salesman in the cannabis industry. Um, King's Cannabis is one of the most well-liked brands out there. And it's one of the ones that when you talk about it, people expect you to talk about it with like a certain, um, like they have a certain mindset and a certain standard for King's. And it, they do for all cannabis companies. It's not unique to, but King's sits at the top of that. And that's you. And I know that that's you. And I see it on your socials and everything like that. Like, I see you walking through the garden with a smile on your face, just like you, you're never been happier than when you're around those plants, dude. And I, I think that everybody should aspire to try to find something like that to do every day, because I bet it's done wonders for your psyche. You know? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, first off, to just correct it. It's not just me. It's the entire team. There you it's go. All the people like, I mean, uh, you know, I, I just posted about the uh, yesterday. I think we're we popped a bunch of seeds and we were doing a pheno hunt and everything like that. And like, you know, it's me and my top dude, Alex, you know, we're the ones who spend the majority of the time in the garden. But like when we are ready to find out which pheno we're going to run through after you know four or five months of working on strains i'm like okay everybody come in everybody the fucking payroll person you know the trimmers you know everybody gets to be a part of it and um i think that was like one of the differences with you know back in the past you know it still had that vibe but like now it's like such a homey moment, like where everybody in there, we all get along. It's like a family vibe more than anything else. And not to be the dumb hippie of the podcast, but you know, plants do feel off of those vibes. And like, I've, I've known just in my personal past when I've been going through shit or having like a bad time, my garden suffers. So like, you know, my boy, Alex, he's so funny. We have deep philosophical conversations around the plants. I'm like, okay, well that's soaking in too. So, yeah, you know, he is kind of a death metal dork. So, uh, he, 
<laughs> he will occasionally be listening to death metal, but sometimes it, the weed likes it. As long as he's vibing and happy, that's all that matters. Yeah, so. yeah. I think that's probably where it gets most of its energy is what your what what's coming out of you after you're experiencing that exactly. music, you know. And um, dude, I, I I mean, I can't blame the guy. I'm a I'm a punk rocker at heart, but every now and then there's a crunchy metal tune. I mean, I picked between my punk and Drublick shirt and my Slayer shirt today. I didn't know which one to wear. Uh, I went with the punk and Drublick one just because it hadn't worn it in a while. But uh, um, that's great. And Alex Adney uh, is an absolutely wonderful person too. Somebody that I've been fortunate enough to work with. Work with his uh, better half, uh, Jamie at White Label, who actually I got to listen to on your podcast, Grown Local. Um, I scrolled through until I found some names that I knew, and I was trying to just listen to as many as possible before you came on. Um, and we will definitely get to that and talk about it. And I want to plug uh, in the description of this, you guys, you'll be able to find um, the link to Grown Local. You'll be able to find all of Mike's socials because you definitely should go and seek him out because, like I said, I mean, if nothing else, it's just when I see the stories in the morning, it just makes me happy. It's like, look this guy and his plants and then i also get to see like kind of a little peek behind the curtain of some amazing cultivation of some amazing products and and i think that that's something that um is kind of cool about the industry too is that like some people are really close to the vest and you'll never see behind the closed door and other people are like look dude i'm doing if you want to know what actually goes into this you would have to get to the six inches between my ears (laughs) not just walk in the door so i love that you give some behind the scenes footy and stuff like that you know well, I mean, and that's kind of, you know, when we're talking about the burnout, that's some of the things that kind of piss me off about the industry. Like, I managed a grow shop for six years. So, like, everybody that has a cannabis company here in town, I knew them back when they were doing garage grows. And, mm-hmm. like, we were, like, plant nerds. And everybody would just hang out at the grow shop like it was a record store. We'd all talk about ideas and different things. And then the second legalization happen you know people started dropping you know like uh what's the word um shit um you know uh they the, nobody wanted to talk about their secrets oh yeah everybody but, started trying to be exclusive with their strains and yeah, everything like that well, th- not even just the strains, their thoughts and ideas like you know to me through my podcast through all the things like even working at the grow shop there's national nutrient companies who the owners have come through Oregon and specifically Eugene and been like this is some of the greatest herb I've ever seen and like to me that was because of the community that we were right and sharing those ideas and it was a very small town I mean so I worked at a grow shop back when I was in Philly too other than the bar uh Eugene 150,000 people or whatever has three national organic nutrient companies selling specifically for cannabis. Wow. Nowhere else in this country, in this world, not even the Netherlands or those places have that many nutrient companies. So I'm in Philadelphia selling nutrients that were made here in Eugene, shipped all the way over there, and people asking about it and, like, getting to know being like, yeah, that was the culture I came from. And, like, to me, cannabis and everything we're doing, it's all about culture. It's all about community. So, like, when people went for the dollar, I was like, you kind of fucking up what we made so well around here, you know? Mm-hmm. So Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's rich. It's a rich part of the culture, especially in a place like Eugene and, and really Oregon in general. You have that, you know, the keep Portland weird vibe. And Eugene has always been, um, you know, like a deadhead town, you know, I mean, yeah. going all the way back to the 60s. And, I mean, they filmed Animal House for here, for Christ's sake. You know, it's like we've this is a cool place. I, there's some things about this this city in general that really get under my skin. But generally I think it's one of the best places. I think it's one of the better kept secrets, this state at large. If you've had the time to travel around and see all four corners of the state of Oregon, um, you've experienced, I mean, if you, you can't do it in a day, but it's like four seasons in a day. I mean, you end up in a goddamn desert where there's like sand dunes for miles. (laughs) And then all of a sudden you're on one of the most picturesque coastlines. You go a little bit North and it's like, holy shit, this is one of the most rugged coastlines I've ever seen. This is deadliest catch in a nutshell. <laughs> and then you go out, out, uh, you know, to the northeast part of the state. That's where I'm from. That's the mountain ranges and and just crazy winter weather. They got snow the other day over there, you That's know. Awesome. <laughs> and then we've got this beautiful valley too that runs all the way from the north to the south of the state. I just feel like Oregon is, uh, and and dude, how biased am I? Like I don't have the New Jersey and and Philadelphia experience. I've traveled a bit, but I'm born and bred in this state. And I think that's kind of, 
Um, I, I like hearing that you, somebody that works for a company that is, you know, at, at its roots, very community minded and stuff like that. And now you've grown to a, a popularity level that this is like a lot of people see you and you're perpetuating these ideas through that company. And I love to hear that because I feel like it's a very Oregon thing. Yeah. I, I do feel like the state kind of in obviously in specific situations, it's totally corporate and there's the big high rises <laughs> that you can find too. But um, you know, that's always been part of, of what I like about Oregon and, and you see it across the populations too, because it happens in Eugene and it also happens in the little tiny town I grew up in when there's 2000, where there's 2000 people. <laughs> the difference is just, you feel like everybody knows your shit just because you kind of know everybody. That's the only difference. Well, and I mean, I've driven cross country twice, so I've gotten to see, I think it's like maybe 15 states I've yet to be to. Okay. And after COVID, hopefully that'll change and like Oregon's still the top. But, yeah. But you know, it is, it does have this small, lovely vibe to it but also big and expansive. Like I tell people it's a drive across Philadelphia. It takes like maybe an hour to do it depending upon traffic. And Philadelphia has the entire population of Oregon plus 1.5 million <laughs> just in that hour drive across, you know, type of thing. So yeah. it is big. So here it's definitely a lot more kind of small. And I feel like that helps it make it a community vibe to it. Like, I mean, whether whatever political spectrum you're on, like at the end of the day, everybody just loves this place and wants to keep like flourish that, you know, sure. It'll definitely be cool. You know, I think the cutoff should be 2009 and nobody else moves here because that's when I moved here. But then after that, we're fucking done. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I feel like the secret's getting out for sure. I've, I've heard um, kind of a cliche about the East coast versus the West coast. And I want to test it on you to see. I bring it. I've heard that the, the Eastern part of the United States is kind, but not nice. And I've heard that the Western part of the United States, and this, this focuses more on LA, but still the Western part is nice, but not kind. Is there any truth to that? Um, I think, yeah, yeah. A little bit. Um, there's this weird part of the East coast where I believe, you know, maybe Oregon, but specifically California, if you brought most of those people to the Northeast, which is the version of the Pacific Northwest out there, they would immediately cry <laughs> just because of how harsh and how mean people are. But at the end of the day, it's like, you're a fucking idiot, but I'll help you change your tire type of thing. <laughs> but like people would be like, oh, I'm so bummed. Your tire got flat. Okay, bye. Like, right. you know, like that type of vibe. Like the East Coast is definitely harsh. You know, that's the nice thing with me and Seth is we get to connect He's becoming a little bit more of a West Coast dude now. But, like, I can make fun of him and, like, hopefully push him to cry almost. But at the end of the day, he ever needs anything up there for the dude yeah. type of thing. And yeah. like, to me, that's where I think it should be. Like, words are words or they do things, but it's the intention of the matter. But, yeah, the East Coast is a little bit more harsh. Yeah. But well, they got to deal with, I mean, the weather alone. Like oh. just the weather, the weather patterns that happen when it's like, all right, say bye to fall. The next five <laughs> months are fucked every single year. You know, I don't know how long it lasts, but I also feel like too the West Coast has got a little bit of that. Um, it's a little bit of a of, of kind of a masked vibe because it's like you're saying like, oh, your tire broke down. That's such a bummer. <laughs> Rather than helping, they're gonna pull out their phone and videotape you try to do it by yourself. <laughs> You know, and it's like they had the empathy, but they didn't have that. And meanwhile, I feel like if I was out in Philadelphia, it's like, come here, you fucking idiot. Let me tell you how to change this goddamn tire so I don't have to help you next time, you know. Uh, but I, I, I've i always loved that about it. I think that that's part of, of uh, you know, the fun part about the United States is like you don't really have to drive that far and you can find a, a completely different like uh. style of, of like, you know, lifestyle, like a completely different vibe and a completely different community. You know, I spent some time down South in uh, new Orleans and also in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And yeah, so as far as hospitality is concerned, like they don't, around down there with hospitality you will never get like a little <laughs> bit of an angry server in the in the like the deep south in that bible belt like everybody's almost too happy to see you it's <laughs> you're like is it fake no i've seen fake i've been to the, i've been fake. to california i've seen fake <laughs> um but i loved it down there too and the food oh my god the food i can't wait it's one of the places at the top of my list to go back to once 
everything's done with COVID is I want to take my wife to New Orleans and just experience the culture down there because she's never been and I love it. Um, you know, but we also like she's got family in upstate New York. And so we want to get kind of to that area to the Northeast and, and actually get out there and see it because I've got a buddy I went to college with who's who lives in um, God, I can't remember, but it's like up by like Poughkeepsie and like the like really upstate, like where people go to see the leaves and the, on the fall and stuff like that. And so we're going to get up there too, but I also want to see the cities. You know, I would really like to go to Philadelphia. I feel like there's a lot of history there that uh, just is awesome to be a part of an experience, you know, in person. Well, that's the cool thing about Philadelphia too. It's one of my favorite cities. I know I'm biased or whatever, but you literally have like my brother, his first apartment in Philadelphia, he could see the headquarters of Comcast building which is a massive huge huge fucking building (laughs) and then two blocks to the south was the first street in america wow like the first cobblestone street in america that's still there with the bar that i worked at in philadelphia two blocks uh to the right i don't know that doesn't mean anything but it's old city uh two blocks to the right is benjamin franklin's office where That's he just crazy. fucking would work at. <laughs> and then on the weekends, it's just these drunk bitches walking down cobblestone streets. With heels on. Yeah, with heels on. I, we would, I, me and the kitchen staff would go smoke cigarettes and just laugh and watch that shit. <laughs> so it is kind of cool like that. I do feel like with the East Coast, everybody's fucking packed in on each other. So there is that vibe of, I have to let out this anger, but I'm still going to be there to help you. Oregon, especially I think is entrenched in a lot of people who came out here just wanted to be the fuck away from everybody. (laughs) Very true. They had a whole video game about it called the Oregon trail. Like people died to get the fuck away from what was going on over there. (laughs) Yeah. They were just kind of like, let me be out in the fucking woods. And that's, I mean, that's honestly who I am. Half of me wants to be in a city. The other half of me wants to be in the woods. And I think that's why Eugene is so perfect for me. It's the duality of it. You know, Uh it's right there there for it so that's why i fell in love with it yeah i love it man so um as far as the the flower cultivation goes um talk to me real quick before we get away from it too much about like your favorite strains that you guys have got right now your favorite strains that you're in the works i know you do a lot of pheno hunting too right so you're constantly coming up with with new strains you're crossing old strains i mean i I don't really understand that part of it very well so (laughs) speak carefully because you might break my brain but um you know what do you have in the works that you can actually tell us about and what are you excited about in the future for king's cannabis right now well so that's where i have to be careful um i really bore the fuck out of cannabis for people sometimes okay (laughs) like where they're just like oh jesus christ i just wanted to know what would get me high (laughs) but uh so at kings we do we do a lot of seed and pheno hunting we're always trying to be ahead of the curb of what's new to the market and what's coming out we don't do breeding projects there too much so you know we're just you know getting seeds and finding phenos that way okay um so we're kind of just keeping our ear to the ground making sure that the best that's out there we can find it and then we also do organic no-till style so it's it's this process of basically i'm not so much growing weed anymore is i'm bringing alive an ecosystem in the room so it's oh, like awesome. i'm not feeding the plants anymore basically like no bottled nutrients no nothing it's cut the price of the production of the cannabis and to me raised up the quality way more and it's just like if you went out and threw a plant out into the old growth woods and you're sure. like all right Soil fucking grow it. I'm not going to touch it. Let it do its thing. Um, So that's been really fun. That's been reinvigoration for me is to learn like soil biology. I'm working with labs, testing, you know, biological inputs every week type of thing. So I'm really enjoying that process of it. But yeah, we're constantly going through seeds and uh, new phenos. Um, I don't know when this is going to drop, but the OCT right now, the OG cherry tree is one of my favorites. The papaya cake, we just had a write up in Leaf Magazine, which was fucking awesome. That's great. Um, it was a great strain. Um, but basically, we're trying to make it so that whatever we grow will taste like it because I know a lot of cannabis farms, depending upon the way that they grow, the stuff just kind of tastes uniformly. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to allow the natural parts of the cannabis plant to express itself and to show what it's doing. I love it. So you get to really taste some fun stuff. 
That's great, man. And I, you know, as far as the science and the actual nuts and bolts behind it, I can get really lost. But as a connoisseur, I don't even want to call myself that. I'm the connoisseur in the way that you know somebody that drinks wine drinks out of a box. But I, <laughs> I like to go out and spend some money on some good cannabis. And when I'm smoking flour, which is not often, because I worked for an extract company, and one thing I found with extracts was. Uh, fewer trips to the bong for me and that I kind of liked because it's like once again my doctor's gonna bitch about it sooner or later so <laughs> um but you guys had a strain and it well, it's still stuck with me and I actually it was only just a couple of weeks ago um I had a little bit left of the shatter that white label had produced from King's cannabis double tangy banana and I had saved that like I mean That's, it was yeah. I guarded it like Helen Keller in my fridge up here dude and <laughs> I seriously, the I was kind of a, I was celebrating something. I don't even remember what because it was such a good extract because it came from such good flour. But I really enjoy the flavor differences. I mean, when when something is named purple and it doesn't taste like that purple that I'm looking <laughs> for, which I like, I can't tell you what it tastes. It tastes like purple. That's the best yeah. way I can describe it. But if it's not there, I just am, I'm always disappointed. I never find that with your guys' stuff. So I, I love to hear that you're like not only is are you already doing it, but you're working more towards making it even like set itself apart even further because it's always been delicious, dude. And I I mean You're gonna make me blush. I really appreciate <laughs> it. Um, you know, it's it's not the it's not ultimately the path to riches sometimes, but I think it will be the path to setting ourselves apart. And honestly, like I said, at this point in my life, I don't give a fuck anymore. Right. So I'm going to do what it, I enjoy and what, you know, may brings me happiness type of thing. And it seems like the things I'm doing right now, people are kind of being like, you know what? I like that too. So like, that's cool. And you know what, if you do that, if you go for yourself and what you want to do in life, those people will show up and they will support you and they will be there. And it's the same thing with for my flower too. Mm -hmm. Like, and the same thing with other things I've been in my doing in my life. And uh, if you just stay true to it, I, gonna be there yeah it's gonna be there exactly and that's part of innovation too is somebody has to look at it from a different perspective at some point in time and that sounds like what you're doing like you're saying look because i don't give a fuck what you think <laughs> i'm gonna go ahead and think what i think and i i love that idea i mean that's once again that's why we're sitting here yeah, right yeah. now you know um I, I you know i say it i've said it a few different times there was a we, I used to work for, you know, the show and hear the donkey show. And, uh, and those guys had a, a job opening here just recently. And it's like, we all know having worked so long together that that's my job and they're just not going to give it to me because I don't have tits. <laughs> and it was one of those things where it's like, well, fuck those people. And I don't want to work for people like that, yeah. that don't understand the relationship behind the reason that the thing is good. It needs to, you need to see it from the perspective of the people creating it and understand that one of the guys, Tanner always says this is like, the 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 right decision in the public's eye might not always be the right decision behind closed doors and you have to sometimes make the decision that isn't always going to endear you to the masses but maybe it 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 opens up a new door and there's more masses behind that door you know i mean i don't well, know it's i try to be like i'm getting a little bit too like meta and philosophical about it but i it's a way i think it's kind of how my brain moves from from point to point is that like I, I feel like we would go right up to Portland where they're at right now. And if I was, and this is going to sound like me just begging, but if we were there, we would kill it just like we were killing it when we were down here in Eugene. Yeah. Um, but there's people that are, you know, making decisions uh, states away that don't like that idea. And so that's why we're here is because the well, same thing with you. Fuck those people and what they think. <laughs> I'm going to do what I want to do. And if people want to come find me here, they will. And exactly. that's the same and thing with, with you. And also with stuff like that, it's like corporate stuff. It's usually just numbers. They're mm -hmm. like, oh, so this is the number where we have the potential for the most people. Well, fuck the most people. Like, I like the the, the few weirdos. Like, you know, <laughs> that's my favorite thing. And there's a lot more of them than you could ever fucking imagine. So yes. they're going to show up for you. And that's, I mean... I don't know how long I have in life, so I'm just kind of like whatever. I'll just do whatever I want. Yeah, and and those and it thankfully it's worked out for me. I've been extremely lucky, but those people will show up. There's they're they're out there. And yep. I mean, with how fucking weird I am, and in comedy having success and everything like that, it's like okay, well then fucking anybody should be able to. <laughs> as long as you're being true to yourself like the yep. weird shit i talk about people are like i want to hear more of that i'm like you fucking are insane 
<laughs> yep, yep. And I, you know, I wanted to get to that too because I feel like a good example of they will show up is when we uh, we did uh, a little comedy show. In fact, there's a poster hanging up on the wall right across from you there, uh, Laughed and Loaded, yeah. where uh, of course yourself, Seth Milstein, Alex Adney, who we talked about earlier, and uh, Billy Wayne Davis, who you do a podcast with, all came out and did a, a comedy show that was put on by White Label. It was uh, back when. Some some things were a little bit uh, less defined in the rule book. Gray let's areas, say that, yeah. yeah and uh, we uh, we always like to say, hey, if there's a gray area, I'll stand in it until somebody tells me to move. And uh, we had a totally cannabis friendly um, comedy show that over 200 people showed up for. Um, they were making, I mean, they would sprinkle weed on your pizza and put it in the oven and bring, bring you <laughs> basically a decarbed edible that you could eat. And we had a dab bar. Um, we had people walking around handing out joints. It was really a one of a kind thing. It's the only type, the uh, only thing of its type that I've ever experienced. And, um, dude, the comedy I thought was just magical because you want to have a great room, get everybody stoned. Like nobody <laughs> in that room was not stoned and everybody was there for it. So, um, what was your experience that night? That was shortly after you'd come back to the West yeah. Coast, right? I mean, so that was the the first season of me and Billy's podcast was Eugene. We wanted to showcase that. So, like, we were recording interviews at that time, and we were like, oh, and we get to do this fucking awesome show. <laughs> and it was just right when I was coming back. And uh, it's a nice welcome home, you know? Like, all these people, like, I do know a lot of people in the cannabis industry, so it's like, hey, come back home and get to do a show with a bunch of people that, you know, you love and are in a community with, which was super, super cool. Definitely got way too stoned because I listened to set. I don't like smoking before my sets just because, like, I need a certain level of anger right. in my life in order to do comedy. And weed's just too good at suppressing that part well, of Weed you. just makes me happy to be alive. It's the <laughs> hardest part. Like, weed's the one thing where I'm like, man, I could just be happy just being. So I got to keep it at a distance sometimes so that I can get shit done. Sure. But, um, yeah, so I was definitely way too high for that. Uh, <laughs> but I had so much fun, and, yeah, it was just amazing, and especially White Label and all the people that worked so hard to make it happen was awesome. Um, and also, like, I do comedy to hang out with my friends. Right. That's what I do. Like, that was the weirdest part for me is, like, the first while of doing comedy – Nobody knew that I grew weed. They thought that I just worked at a gardening store and, like, you know, I was just like, oh, yeah, I'm nobody type of thing. But so, like, for me, cannabis, I've been able to make a good living off of. So, comedy has just been bonus and extra fun that I get to have. Mm -hmm. So, just hanging out with everybody in the green room, you know, watching Andrew steal things while. <laughs> <laughs> While Billy's taking fucking dabs and shit like that, I'm like, okay, these are the type of people I love being around. So, <laughs> yeah, man, I remember, you know, I was I was one of the people that kind of put that show together, and we thought, you know, we can get an hour out of Billy for the for the money that we're spending. We think that that's a great value. And dude, he must have stood up there for an hour and 40 minutes. I mean, he just kept going. And it was like, by the end of it, I was like, we, I should tell him that he's at his time because I forgot that we don't have a light in the back of the room. And he's so high, he might just not know, you know. But that was a great, everybody had great sets that night. Um, it was my first and only jump back on the stage that came after my radio days. I haven't done, aside from hosting some some uh, trivia nights and some game show nights and stuff like that for uh there's, there's actually a couple buddies of mine that invented a board game that we used to do like a bar night with. That's awesome. I didn't really do much of that. And I, dude, it was, I mean, for one, I was really high too. Let's not forget that. But the other thing about it was like, he got back on stage and you felt that thing that you can only feel on stage. Even if you do love being around the plants as much as you do, it's the same <laughs> thing with the plants. They give you something that you can't get anywhere else. Being on stage when you're the only one. It gives you something that you can't get anywhere else. And it can it could take it away, too. I mean, it can wreck Real you and quick. put you in a dark room for four or five days thinking about what you said and why you said it. <laughs> but, God damn, I have a lot of fun doing it. Um, do you have anything comedy-wise in the works? Are you still kind of fighting with the COVID thing? I know that's been a huge deal for a lot of comics. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, you know, I was on the Shane show with Seth as the last show that I've done indoors, mm -hmm. you know, since COVID happened. That was Shane Torres at Lucky's. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to keep it chill. I mean, you know, there's all these discussions around COVID and whatnot and this and that. But, like, to me, I'm cool with being zen. You know, I got my cannabis. I got my stuff. I can just kind of sit here and savor 
and wait for it. So I'm just I'm excited to get back to it once it makes itself available. Mm -hmm. Um, but other than that, I'm cool with just chilling. I yeah. we we tried to do some outdoor shows this summer, which I did, and that was fine and it was awesome that people put it on and did all those things but at the end of the day you know there's this way that i like to fuck you know <laughs> like there's this there's this way i like doing comedy a specific way it has to be in a dingy bar where it's just like don't be here during the daytime to sure. see what goes on you know that's bad. Don't check your feet when you walk out, type of thing. There's and just a whole rolodex of bars that I'm <laughs> running through my mind's eye right now. Exactly, and like that's that's the way I enjoy it, you know. And you know, it's been it's been hard to see, like you know, being able to kind of be okay not doing it. It's been hard to see other people go through it where it's just fucked up a lot of their life and like yep. you know at the time that COVID hit the person that I was dating she was a musician burlesque dancer and would be on the road for 150 you know shows a year wow. and then like her income just gone that's and so her crazy. whole thing and like you know it's just like fuck man and you know Billy who I do the podcast with he's on the road constantly and then COVID hit and it's just like all right I'm just gonna sit at home it's like, well, shit. So. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a real bummer, dude, because, I mean, it, look, the, the people affected are the people performing, and then you kind of don't think right away, but there's a lot of people that fought their inner demons by just going out and spectating those things, too, and that's a whole second wave of people that get hit by um, something that's totally out of their control, and, and you know... Um, I don't, it, now that I've gotten a little bit older, like going out to bars in the middle of the week isn't really something that I'm, I'm doing. Like you'll catch me at a happy hour at a, at yeah. a growler fill or something like that, but I'm, I'm not really out burning the midnight oil anymore, but I've had this weird itch the whole time COVID's been going on to get, I mean, just put pen to paper, like start writing. The other day I was laughing at myself in the shower and I was like, <laughs> you got to write that down. And then I remembered that I took a big dab before the shower. I was like, don't write that down. That's bullshit. I thought it was but, because you looked down. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just a constant. But in 2020, I got real familiar with myself. So, you know, I didn't put on clothes for five weeks one time. So, um, awesome. <laughs> well, and no, and you should go out and do it again. Like I've always enjoyed your comedy and, you know, it's, to me, it's about the process more than anything. Like at this point in my life, it's experience. Mm -hmm. uh, life is an experiential thing. You know, if you, you want, you can do whatever, literally whatever. Like you could just go out and do whatever. Like, yeah. Anybody who's listening right now, if you have a thought in your mind, you could just go fucking out and do it. You just may do get it. arrested. Yeah. You may get shot, but you could just go out and fucking do it. And there's no other rules <laughs> than that. You know, like... Just fucking go out and do it because, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you want to catch fish? Just go fish. And if they arrest you, then get the appropriate license and go back and fish. <laughs> like, you can do anything. Or and then maybe you want to, you know, uh, upheaval the entire police state after being arrested for fishing. You so go. you can do that also, you know. <laughs> Sometimes experiences bleed into other experiences and dreams build upon each other. Get so. yourself a real nice monochromatic logo of half your face, put it on a t-shirt, and start a, start a revolution, yeah, man. I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, dude, well, um, I've, I'm glad to hear that once COVID does clear up and, and you're in a good spot that that, or, you, you know, excuse me, let me rephrase that. I'm you're never in a, in a good spot. Don't put that on me. Don't ever put that on me. You're in a Zen spot. I'll say that is better because that's your words. And then you'll get back to it once it's appropriate for you. And I love that. I, I've, I had somebody reach out to me, uh, Nick Lanier from down in Medford. He reached out just last night and was like, look, I'm trying to book shows in May. Like, and it's the first time somebody's tried to book me in. Well, nobody's really ever tried to book me. I was fortunate <laughs> with the radio show. I just forced my way onto shit, and we just yeah, yeah. we had the platform, so I got to do it. But, um, and it, you know, it's it's one of those things where it's like five to ten minutes is all he wants, and I'm sitting there just I'm worried sick about it, and I haven't even booked the fucking date yet. <laughs> so I, I know that it's going to be a little bit of a transition for me too. But I think this helps. And talking to people like yourself and Seth and Andy, I had Dylan Flynn on uh, just a couple of days ago. And it has been so refreshing to talk to you guys and just know that there's still, there's this little fucking ember that's burning that didn't get blown out in 2020 <laughs> and it's not yet been blown out in 2021. And sooner or later, somebody's going to blow uh, an inordinate amount of air on it and it's going to light a fire. And I'm really excited about that. I think that, 
Um, you're going to see stand-up comedy. I, I, it just, as a fan of stand-up comedy, I feel like something like 2020 is going to advance the art form further because you're going to have your st- your 2020 guys that want to come out and they want to hit all the main COVID bullet points and they want to do that kind of little bit hacky, if you ask me, but they're going to hit them and it's going gonna, it's gonna to play. And then you're also going to hear comedians that aren't ever going to touch it or they're going to find a way to, to go on a tangent and it's going to it's going to force people to have to pull away from the low hanging fruit and to be yeah. better, you know, at well, least as a fan, that's what I hope. And that's what I think, but I, I don't know. I could be it's wrong. It's the same thing with everything. Like I remember, uh, I had to fill in for somebody and host an open mic right F like six months after Trump got elected. And at the end of the night, I was like, if another one of you makes a fucking joke about the color <laughs> of his goddamn skin, which <laughs> Y'all wouldn't fucking do for Obama. I'm going to lose it. I fucking hate Trump, and I'm so tired of the orange jokes. Just come up with something better for not the first thought that comes into your mind. Be right. better than that. But right. Jesus Christ. And isn't that almost always the way it is with political comedy? Like comedy that's going to either, you know, kind of pander to one side or the other. It's like. I feel like sometimes it's always low hanging fruit because the, all they're trying to do as politicians in their career is make the other guy look like <laughs> shit. So there's plenty of ammo for your gun out there if that's the bullet you want to fire. Well, I mean, most open mics, like you know, uh, it's a lot of low hanging. <laughs> oh that's God, how that's dude. how we get to stand up on your own. <sighs> and like, I won't shit talk low hanging fruit. God knows that I make enough of them myself. But you know, it is just like, God, come on. <laughs> The, just I get bored with it, you know, so. Yeah, it's, I mean, like there was a guy that used to come to our, our gong show. Yeah. You probably remember this guy. I don't, for the life of me, remember his name, and I'm sorry if you're out there listening. He's not. Motherfucker, how dare you forget an open micer's name <laughs> for a decade ago? Especially when he was the only guy that came to every gig dressed like Charlie Chaplin. He had a full three-piece suit on and a derby hat, and he would go up and he would hit five minutes worth of jokes, and it would be very hit and miss. A lot of miss, some oh, hits, miss. but every single week he showed up in that tuxedo with that derby hat on and he went up there and he did his thing. And by God, I salute you, dude, because you are a true <laughs> open micer. Like you've committed and you're in this thing with us. And, uh, but, you know, there's also the people that uh, we, uh, you know, it's been well discussed on this show. The the radio show's open mic that we did was hosted at a college grind time bar, and it yep. was not a comedy conducive environment at all. And a lot of times we got some people up there that were like, you know, they were the guys that were there to rub their genitals on something, but they thought they could also give this comedy thing a go. You know, and <laughs> I make my friends laugh. I make my friends laugh. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, you know, that was an open mic that I went to f- for quite some time and i can't honestly remember any other joke that i did on that stage other than one night i had to go very last and that was when you know all the young college kids were coming in and then my set just fucking sucked and then at the end of it i go well this wasn't good but it's because you know the bar's turning into a date rape speed dating (laughs) and they all got so pissed but the bartender was like that's that was very fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then that bar got shut down years Four later. Speed. <laughs> so, yes, that uh. did suck. <laughs> and that's not good. Rape is bad. Rape is bad. And rape jokes are questionable sometimes. But it was just that bar was so horrifically bad for comedy. For comedy. <laughs> and it was all they wanted to do was try to bring a different crowd. And it's like, I don't think you understand. You're an institution in this at this university. <laughs> Nobody else in the city goes to this bar. It's only yes. the people from the university. But uh, it was fun. I thought that it was uh, it was an interesting test in, like, you know, uh, stage presence, I felt mm. like, was always tested at that place because one day you'd show up and both the TVs would be on over your shoulders. The next day you'd show up and there would be, like, a bachelorette party at the table right in front of the stage, which was normally where the comedians and people that wanted to see comedy would sit. <laughs> and you would have to tell jokes over their head to the back to where, like, the bar was so that the people that wanted to hear you could hear you. Other times there was just people fighting. You know, it was just a fight at the pool table or yeah, something, yeah. you know, and it was just, it, it was fun. But it was not where we needed to be. Um, I really enjoyed it. I thought that Drew, um, he put up with so much because I got to go and do the show, and really all I had to do was write stuff. I didn't have to put it on. I didn't have to be there early. Drew was the one that had to deal with the repercussions of gonging someone that didn't think they needed to be gonged, you know? Which, as a comedian, none of the none of the true like professional comedians like yourself 
ever like sometimes it was a party and a and like a almost a challenge to see how quick you could get gonged. I remember you doing that a couple of times where it was like, all right. I like starting trouble. I like having fun with it. But uh, yeah. the best part about it is it was kind of, it had to turn into a little bit of a circus for it to be at that, at that location and still be somewhat fun to go to. Cause there was also the Monday nights where it was just the, like the six of us in there telling the jokes that everybody had heard. <laughs> To one another, you but know. we're so serious, and we're gonna make <laughs> something of this life, and we're gonna we're gonna come against all odds, and we'll be comedians one day. Uh, wishful thinking, but hey, it's fun. It is fun. It, it's, it's fun. I mean, what the fuck else are you gonna do on a Monday night? Are you gonna sit at home watching television? Or are you gonna go out and you know just be in a community with people? Like exactly. at the end of the day, that's all comedy really is. You know, we have when you first get into comedy, you have all these hopes and desires desires and thoughts of what you can make out of it but like i'll say for the rest of my life it's just experiences that's all you get out of it so i got to experience hanging out with my friends and trying to make each other laugh even if there fucking wasn't anybody there that's awesome yeah and they're serving me beer uh, you know well they're serving you surely the temples but they were sure <laughs> they were serving me beer so <laughs> Uh, talk to me about Grown Local, dude. I got to listen to a couple episodes of your podcast just in, in prep. I'm I'm still trying to have this veiled facade that I am a professional, so I try to do prep for the podcast. And um, I checked out a few episodes uh, here over the last uh, week and a half, two weeks. First of all, I got to say, yours and Billy Wayne's back and forth is great. I really do enjoy listening to you guys, uh, Billy Wayne Davis and yourself. Um, just kind of, I think the one that I was listening to right before you showed up was you were introducing yourself as a guest and he was giving you shit because everybody else, you just say, our guest is blank. And, but <laughs> when you were introducing yourself, you had all this like pomp and circumstance that went around it. Talk to me about your podcast and, uh, what are you guys doing with grown local? Well, so first off, before that, I'm going to tell you, Larry King uh, infamously would never read the books or listen to anything that his guests would do just to try and <laughs> go into it with no fucking backing. I mean, not saying you're not Larry King, but maybe well, you know, one day you can do that. I've got his hairline, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> So the fact that you boosted my podcast numbers, I appreciate that if that's only for getting prepared for the interview today. But um, no, so Grown Local, um, and then me and my friend Billy, uh, he's a very funny comedian. Uh, we just started a podcast. We've been trying to start it for three years now. Okay. And we went through two different producers where it just kind of ended up uh, shitting the bed type of thing. But um, the podcast essentially is just interviewing people that are in the cannabis industry and getting their story. Like we want to break down a lot of the stereotypes of it and just kind of show the stories of it. The first season was Eugene and we just tried to showcase what, you know, this community is. And um, it's, it's been a lot of fun because you go into the mindset of like, oh, this podcast is going to be this. And then it kind of shows you what it wants to be, too. Like the first episode of Eugene was awesome, but it was a lot of friends of mine and a lot of people who, you know, maybe didn't want to tell a lot of the stories or anything like that. But um, season two, we went down to Humble and good Lord, can those fuckers talk. <laughs> They got they, all sorts of stories for you, yeah? So many stories. <laughs> well, everybody has stories, but they actually want to share. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that was amazing in itself. And just crazy stories. Like, uh, one of the episodes I'm more proud about is this uh, dude named John. He uh, owns Huckleberry Farm. He's a second-generational cannabis grower. He did eight years in federal prison for cannabis growing back in the day, just like for plants Dude. like they totally fucked him. it was horrendous um his mom ends up dying the first year that he's in prison and just this whole shit show of things that you know went on and like you know he did his time he came out and he still loves cannabis to the point that he went towards the recreational market and now he grows for willie nelson and oh that's awesome like the warden of the prison and the prison guard you know, who felt bad that he even had to go to prison, came to his farm and got cannabis plants from him to grow in their backyard. <laughs> that's you know? awesome. What a great story. 
Yeah, I mean, I just spoiled it, but it's a great episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, and they're hour-long episodes, so they're a lot more in-depth. You'll get to hear more about what happened probably in that federal prison exactly. and outside of it. So, But, yeah, we're just trying to get the backstory, and, you know, uh, with Billy being a funny guy and me being a cannabis nerd and occasionally funny, you know, we're, uh, <laughs> we're just trying to educate people who have no idea about this industry. I mean, when I first moved out here in 09, you know, my father was very worried. He was like, I'm just worried you'll get in trouble with the cartels. And I was like, there's no fucking car. Well, there are cartels, in it, but they only care about meth and cocaine up around here in these here parts. But, you know, um, so and just the interesting story. I mean, there's a lot of shit I've done in my life, a lot of illegal stuff that I'm more than willing to talk about and share. And, you know, if somebody wants to come talk about it later, fuck them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's all for entertainment purposes and in perpetuity and may have never or not happened. But, yeah, I fucking did it. Um <laughs> Which is, it's oh, I a, love it. It's a fun podcast, and now it's expanding out. Um, we have a Patreon too, which is fucking awesome. And I'm teaching Billy to grow organic cannabis, and um, a friend of ours, uh, his name is Jason or uh, Justin Lasik. Uh, he was a Green Beret in Afghanistan. He got both of his legs and his fucking balls blown off in an IUD. What? Yeah, it's fucking intense. And the the fucked up part about it is that Green Beret group, he was their medic. So he got blown up and he's there suffering those injuries and having to tell his buddies how to treat him and like like they had like a syringe ready to inject him to knock him out and he had to tell them to wait to do it until he could fully explain to them how to treat his injuries and he's a fucking amazing oh, dude dude what a hardcore champion that he's guy a must fucking be. badass <laughs> he was yeah. on rogan too so you can see his interview up there and really he's like one of the most intelligent people i've ever met and like so I'm teaching him to grow weed, which is crazy because yeah. <laughs> he wants to use it and he wants to get vets who have PTSD to, you know, help train them through it. You know, he's yeah, really hardcore with helping vets who have gone through shit. And like, I'm training a green beret how to grow weed. So I feel like a fool. <laughs> <laughs> A Green Beret that was also a medic. Like, yeah. he's not only that, but he's good enough. He's, he can kill you with his bare hands. He can also bring you back to life with those same bare hands. That's amazing. Yeah, he's an amazing dude. And so, like, it just – and it was because he's a friend of ours through mutual friends. And, like, he heard the podcast and he's like, this is dope. And we were talking to him because, you know, it, I started talking to him before he got out of the military after his injury. And I was telling him, you know, what to use to try and deal with PTSD and everything else else like that so i eventually was like hey man you want to grow weed with us <laughs> That's and he was great. like fuck yeah i do <laughs> and you know so it's just been a fun experience with it and like i said i'm just out here having fun um we're wrapping up season two of humboldt and uh next month i'm flying out to colorado and we'll be interviewing a bunch of people out in colorado and doing season three and our whole hope is to kind of hit all these little pockets and all these different places to kind of you know, get the story of what it's been like because, sure. you know, other than Dateline and outside money flooding in, most people don't know the real people in this industry and, you know, the struggles. And the fact that a lot of times it's just mom and pop farmers who are like, let me grow some cannabis to, you know, be able to have my working chicken farm go at the same time. Right, and right. the fact that they've been demonized and turned into criminals when they're like, oh, he's just a chill dude who likes weed and also likes money. You know, he was not a fucking straight up criminal. So. Yeah. And even a lot of the guys that were quote unquote straight up criminals. I was a straight up criminal. Yeah. So. <laughs> but you weren't a straight up criminal. That's just that you were only criminal because you were selling something that was deemed illegal. And now that we've <laughs> sat here for fuck, what, six, seven, eight, ten years now in the state. And we realize people aren't ripping their clothes off and running naked through the streets on weed. Like it's it's one of those things that's just always kind of been under my skin and and what I hate to and this I this is gonna go away from your podcast and I promise I'll bring it back but I feel like a lot of times cannabis is used as a political pawn, mm -hmm. um you know just just this week New York uh, recreationally legalized which is great because it's probably another destination for you guys to go to to tell the story with grown local at some point in time, um 
But I mean, I, I did a little, I was doing a little news and variety show and I was like, nothing like legalizing cannabis to take the eyes off of the fact that Cuomo just slapped his assistant's ass in the lobby, <laughs> you know? And, and I feel like that's going on right now. The guy's got mounting counts against him. And he's like, well, yeah, legalize cannabis. Legalize and, it. Yeah. Get the eyes off of me. And, and I, I'm happy, super happy that a state like New York is legalized recreationally. But at the same time, I also kind of see through that curtain and I'm like, what the fuck else is going on back there? What are you doing? You well, know, I, I mean, we've known for quite some time that cannabis is fine. It's just like anything else. Some people like beer. Some people like cannabis. Yep. And it is what it is. I think I the, love both. Yeah. By the way. <laughs> but I think honestly, the whole time it's just been fear about money. It's been fear about power going into other people's hands and, you know, specifically being like, no, we don't this is just like like beer you have to distill it you have to do all this this is just a plant you can throw in some fucking dirt (laughs) we don't know how to tax this we don't know how to actually do the things around it they're figuring it out like going and interviewing people down in california and seeing how much more extensive the overregulation is compared to oregon it's just like oh fuck that means that California is more for big business and they want to screw out the mom and pop people. I mean, like, and that's the thing that I love about Oregon, whether you're conservative, hippie, liberal, whatever, all the small towns here in Oregon, you're going to find people who are like, man, I got a farm. I do this. And like, I like buying from the source. I like knowing the people. I like the communities of it. And there's just elements here in America who want to destroy that. And they're on both sides. Oh yeah. And they want to take that away from people. And so like, whether it's, you know, your fucking farm where you're growing seeds, you're going, growing, you know, nuts or whatever the fuck you're growing. Like, I want to meet those people. I want to buy directly from them. And it's the same thing in cannabis. It's the same thing in beer. I want to, you know, even if I'm not going to drink it, if I'm giving it to a friend, I want to buy from homies who are doing it. That's to me, that's what's destroyed America more than anything is taking it out of the hands of the common folk who, you know, want to work and have a way of life and, you know, actually produce something. Sure. And now we're just like, let's let's make it harder for them so that they have to go and work for somebody else to produce those things. Right, right. Um, and, dude, you know where you see it a lot in kind of a mirrored form is in, in the beer industry. Um, you know, microbrews have been so popular now, and, and especially in Oregon, going back 20 years. I mean, it's been it's been a while now, this this whole microbrewery explosion across the United States, and you start to see big companies like Miller Coors and Anheuser-Busch, and you'll hear – in the news that they bought your favorite brewery, Mm -hmm. but they only, the brewery only sold out because of the distribution. That's what they'll say. But what happens is a small brewery on a micro scale can't keep up with the distribution of a place like Anheuser-Busch. And so you're going to start to buy like wholesale hops. You're going to start to buy wholesale malts. You're going to start to buy shit that the places that you bought from that gave you the product that you had you don't buy that shit anymore. And so you can call it the same thing. Yeah. Black Butte Porter. Okay. Like, sorry, <laughs> but why does it taste like shit now? And five years ago, it was goddamn gold it in a bottle, awesome. you know, and, and that's something that obviously distribution, you know, is, is distribution. And I understand the, the uh, hurdles and everything like that, but to produce like a craft product, to produce something that is, is, uh, you know, capable of standing on its own just because of the merits of the product and how good it is to people, it bastardizes it to to make it something that you can mass produce and just shove out and just use the name. Oh, yeah. And I hate that in alcohol. And I, one thing, the that, same thing in cannabis too. Trust me. Yeah, yeah. And, and right now at a smaller scale because we can't you can't cross state lines with it, of course, but there's a lot of, of the industry that's going, Hey, let's, let's open up these state lines. Like let's start. Be- well, that's also opening the path to kind of, you know, muting down those mom and pops a lot more and really uh, just injecting those big f- wholesale farms with cash and stuff like that. And so, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see where the, uh, where the industry goes as far as cannabis is concerned, because like you said, they're figuring it out. Like it's literally a work in progress. It's, no. it's a running experiment that, that you're a part of now. I, I used to be a part of it. <laughs> and I'll tell you, one of the most frustrating parts about it was the regulation, but that was only because it seemed like things were always changing because they were always kind of trying to make it so that it worked for everybody. And it gave, you know, it didn't give advantages and disadvantages uh, just to, to, to some people. Like it was like, everybody has to deal with the bullshit 
and everybody can reap the benefits, which was kind of cool in the way that they rolled it out. I mean, you wouldn't have ever hear, heard me say this in a sales meeting when I was just a salesman that was responsible for running the shit all the way across the state. Um, I, you know, I actually listened on your guys' podcast. You were talking um, about whether or not you'd ever been pulled over while transporting cannabis. And um, I was pulled over with, like, I don't know how much I had, like eight to ten grand worth of product in my – it's the only time I got pulled over. And I had a uh, I had a ride along with me that day who we were about to hire. So it's like this is this is not how you do it. Don't go <laughs> seventy five in front of cops in a fifty five. But I'll tell you, Mike, that state cop he pulled me over. He looked at my license. He went back and he ran it. And he came up and he goes, "Is this a work truck or a uh, or a personal vehicle?" And I looked back at the Yeti cooler in the back seat of the truck and I said, "Personal." And he goes, all right, slow down, have a nice day. And, you know, handed me my $175 ticket. <laughs> Never checked in that Yeti. And I know 100% that he knew when he looked at his computer that I was packing that shit. He didn't want to deal with it. Yeah. He did not want to have to go through all the paperwork. And you guys drew you guys drew reference to that. And I think it was funny because it's like, man, five years ago, I would be on the hood of this truck with my <laughs> chicken wings and like I could be pleading and you would probably be just pushing my face into the dirt with your knee. And it's it's funny how it's all changed, but God, I love it. I love being a part of it, you know, or, or got, getting to have been a part of it, I guess would be the way to put it. Right. But uh, I'm always going to be a part of the community because I don't see myself ever stopping consuming it, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it is fun just for the fact that it is a historical time. Yeah. Like it's the history is changing. Like I remember driving around illegally with a hundred pounds of weed and just being like, okay, well you're going to spend six hours on the five, just sweating your fucking nuts off. And that was fun in its own right. So <laughs> right. I, I like a little bit of experience. You know, some people go skydiving. I, I drive around with enough <laughs> weed to fuck me up. Uh, I traffic. <laughs> yeah, I traffic. <laughs> I traffic in illicit drugs, but it's only cannabis. So whatever. Yeah. But you know, it, it is, ex you know, it's experiential again, and it's fun to be through this and to also see the bullshit that people, you know, are putting others through, through regulation. I mean, as going through and interviewing people in so many different states, Oregon actually has the easiest regulation structure just from all the things that I've heard. Like California's thrown another five licenses on top of everything like just for transportation wow. and everything like that. And like I said, that's to get rid of the mom and pop people. And like, that's what I'm trying to get people to understand with cannabis because of cannabis. I've been at the ground floor of three small businesses starting up from being like, Hey, this is our first month to being like, Oh, do you know how much we're, we're fucking crushing our sales from last month. And to see, businesses that just started be here and in the community and giving back to the community 10 years later. Like to me, that's one of the side loves that I've gotten to see through cannabis is small business, which I do think is what America should be and is made up to. And, you know, is what's kind of fucked us as of recently. So I think more than anything, uh, with the podcast especially is I'm just trying to be like, hey, everybody watch so that small businesses don't go away and we get fucked this way. So, uh, and But also tell crazy stories about getting pulled <laughs> over too. <laughs> it's important, man. Where can people find Grown Local? Uh, so it's grownlocalpod at gmail.com if you want to write us and uh, you know come on the podcast or something like that. You know, if you have anything cool. Um, we're on Twitter. We're on uh, Instagram at grownlocalpod. Uh, we post pictures of all the farms and different people that we get to visit. We're on Twitter. I forget what that is. But we are on all podcast networks. We're on Spotify, Grown Local podcast so yeah come and check us out it's a lot of fun and um hopefully a little educational and stuff like that but yeah we're wrapping up humble and we'll be out in colorado soon that's awesome that's awesome and we will link all of not only mike's personal socials but we'll get all the podcast socials and uh, link to the Spotify so that you can go uh, like, subscribe, download, share with all your friends. Um, you do not have to be a cannabis enthusiast to enjoy this podcast. You could actually come in as a completely, well, I don't want to say green because I feel like that kind of, you know, <laughs> but you could come in as like somebody with no experience whatsoever and you can not only learn something, but you're going to uh, enjoy the laughter along the way. So check out Grown Local, please. Um, check out Mike's 
uh, personal socials. Um, whenever you get back on stage from a stand-up perspective, I want to have you back on and talk about that type of stuff. Um, anything else that you have for me today, dude, because you're not going to believe this, but we're already like over an hour and, and getting into the second quarter of that second hour. My, so. my, my nicotine phase is kicking in where I'm like, I want a second. All <laughs> so right. I know. There but you go. What I'll say <laughs> is you don't even have to be a cannabis enthusiast to listen and grown local. It's mostly just being a human being enthusiast, just trying to hear the story of people. And that's all we really want to share with it. But, um, yeah, other than that, Hopefully I'll be doing comedy and with you again here soon and uh, you know we'll have fun with it. Dude, you're one of the most genuine people that I've ever sat down and talked to in a, in a long form and I've had the, the pleasure of doing it going all the way back to my radio days and uh, your story is, is a great one and I, I look forward to watching you continue to tell that story and uh, you know the, the work that you do as far as the community for cannabis and everything like that and the people that work for you and, and with you, sorry, um, it's just all great, dude. I, I I absolutely love you as a person, and I'm so glad that you took the time to come in here and see me today. Um, I'm I'm actually humbled by the people that I've gotten to talk to. I never felt like a lot of you guys would want to come in here and just have a <laughs> bullshit conversation with me because, let's be honest, we used to just kind of bullshit a lot on the radio. It's like, what haven't we talked about? But a lot's happened, and I, I've absolutely had a great time with you today. So thank you so much for coming on The Man Room, dude. I've always enjoyed you, and thank you for having me. And so... Is way better than Seth's interview. Right? <laughs> I, I will say I'll give Fuck you, Seth. I'll no. give Seth's interviews only bad marks because of the fucking guy oh, that was stop recording it the audio. Already, right? stop it. No, this has been a lot of fun, and I love hearing you talk to all of my friends, and it's fun talking to you too, buddy. So thanks for having me. Thanks again, Mike. We'll see you next time. That's the Man Room Podcast. Thanks for listening and and the transmission, the transmission.